of all the mysteries that humankind has encountered through the ages, none have had a greater pull on our imagination than the sea. And few individuals have had as strong a pull on our collective imagination as Walt Disney. Walt's deep appreciation for the power and grandeur of the Seven Seas was evident in many of the projects he guided throughout his career. Even Mickey Mouse's first sound film was the maritime classic Steamboat Willie. So deep was his love of things nautical, Walt decided to start his voyage on the Sea of Matrimony, literally, with a honeymoon cruise. That cruise created a special memory that forever kept the salt of the sea and the romance of the cruise close to his heart. Walt's passion for offshore adventures started an odyssey for the Disney Company that would span the seven seas and several decades. The destination, the Disney magic. Join us on a voyage of discovery and witness the birth of this truly magical ship. The adventure started with Disney Cruise Line selecting a team of cruise industry professionals to join the assembled Disney Dream Makers ready for the challenge. From the outset, the designers tried a variety of approaches that ranged from fanciful to futuristic. At the beginning, it was quite challenging. We didn't really know exactly what the ship ought to look like. One idea they had was that, well, why don't you make a very futuristic, Disney is a very progressive company, and one design that uh, they thought should be similar to some other ships, which is painted all white, but yet with some cut out, you know, Mickey motif. But we felt it was not enough. After a spirited competition among the design teams, the initial sketches were presented. Everyone agreed that these preliminary ideas were perhaps a bit too contemporary to be considered classic. But what direction should they take? The answer came from Disney chairman Michael Eisner, who also had an early introduction to the sea. As a child, he watched his grandparents depart on the Queen Mary and was a passenger himself on the last voyage of the Mauritania. These images left an indelible impression on young Michael and it was this sense of grandeur that he wanted the Disney team to capture. When we were in the design phase of the Disney Magic, I kind of came out with uh, the words, let's do a modern classic. Classic in the sense of sleek and ocean-going and romantic and Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth-ish, and modern in the sense that, uh, that it's, of course, got all the modern conveniences that a, that a ship can have today. The team worked diligently to help bridge the gap between the ships of old and the current concept of what a modern classic would look like. To accomplish this task, the team would borrow from the classic styles of the majestic cruise ships from the 1930s. Features reminiscent of the golden age of ocean liners, like sleek bow lines, traditional exterior color schemes, and multiple funnels. Michael's response to the final design was immediate and enthusiastic. That's it. Now that the ship's exterior was agreed upon, the next critical task was finding a shipbuilder to bring the inspired design to life. While many of the renowned classic shipbuilders have gone the way of the history books, there were still thriving shipyards in Japan, Finland, Germany, France, and Italy. Discussions were held with representatives from the leading yards in all these ports. Ultimately, the contract went to the Fincantieri shipyards in Italy. Their 200 years of shipbuilding expertise, combined with Disney imagination, would usher the dream of a modern classic gracing the seas into a reality. The charge for the shipbuilders was not an easy one. Build a ship that was comfortable, even at faster cruising speeds. It had to be seaworthy beyond measure exceedingly secure under all conditions and surpass all current quality standards. 
It was a tall order by anyone's estimation. But Disney's pursuit for a magnificent seafaring vessel was achieved by transforming complex engineering designs into simple yet elegant ship architecture. By the fall of 1996, every significant detail of the ship had been finalized. And a few weeks later, on October 21st, the keel of the Disney magic was laid. Adhering to maritime tradition, a coin was embedded for good luck in the ship's keel. Many ship's officers and crew believe this custom ensures safe passage and good fortune for all that sail on the ship. Now underway, the actual process of creating the Disney magic would be anything but traditional for the cruise ship industry. The ship would be constructed in two parts through a process known as jumboization. One section from bow to midship would be assembled in the historic Ancona shipyard. The rear of the ship, or the stern, would be constructed at their facilities in Megara, 100 miles to the north. The two halves of the ship would be assembled with a modular construction technique that would continually strengthen the ship's hull as each component was added to the structure. From a ship that would come to weigh 83,000 gross tons and stand almost as long as the Empire State Building is tall, the exacting tolerances of less than one quarter inch for each joint and weld would test the limits of the shipbuilder's craftsmanship and skill. After six months of non-stop construction, the Disney Magic's bow and stern were ready to meet for the first time. On April 11, 1997, the bow was completed and floated out to sea the next afternoon. Using ocean-going tugboats, the massive bow section traveled up the coast at a closely monitored speed of three knots. After 42 hours, the bow reached the main canal in Venice that would take it the final distance to becoming complete. At 5 p.m. on April 14th, the two sections were finally within sight of each other at the Magera shipyards. The stern, flooded with water, lay steady on the bottom of her berth as the bow slowly drew closer. After several tedious hours, the two halves were joined together perfectly, and the Disney magic finally became whole. After several more weeks of construction, the Disney magic was floated out to sea for the first time on May 13th to the spirited celebration of the many shipyard workers, plus a few familiar faces. Next came the first of many sea trials, tests that would push the ship to its seaworthy limits to ensure the structural stability and design specifications of the Disney Magic. Sea trials play an important part in the creation of a ship. There are uh, not very many of the cabins are finished by that time and it may be something akin to taking your family car and having it delivered uh, first with the engine, steering wheel and brakes in it and say let's take, put some chairs in it, take it around the block and make sure everything works and then we'll finish off the rest of it. We check things that we can't look at just at the dock. We have things that uh, have to be done under operating conditions. The propellers have to be turning. The shaft has to turn without water coming inside the ship. We deploy the lifeboats and can bring them back on, on the ship within a specified amount of time. We test the anchor. Uh, that's something we can't do at the dock because it's usually pretty shallow at the dock, so we have to let the anchor go out at sea. She really passed all the tests with flying colors and really proved herself to be a true thoroughbred in the greatest traditions of the sea. The battery of tests proved that the Disney magic was ready to finish her interior spaces. Finally, it was time for the shipyard to officially transfer ownership of the vessel to Disney Cruise Line. The Disney magic set sail from